This is Christianity 101, the podcast connecting busy people with Jesus. I'm your host, Rick Grundy. This is episode two. Welcome back to another episode. We're continuing to explore the question, what's so great about Jesus? And to find an answer to that question, today we're looking at Hebrews chapter 1, verses 5 to 14. You know, just this past Sunday, we put on something at my church, we put on something called the Groups and Ministries Expo, where uh, many of the small groups and many of the ministries within Hillside, they set up tables and displays and, and, and lots of creative uh, ways of demonstrating what it is each of our groups and ministries do at Hillside. And we all went down, we, we took a look, and we also ate. We had another hot dog barbecue. I've been telling my neighbors they've got to come out because I'm serving steaks. And when they say, yes, I'll come, I'll say, well, actually, it's tube steaks. And none of my neighbors yet have have come based on this hot dog barbecue. But anyways, while we were looking at all the all the groups and and the ministries, I asked everybody a question. Somebody tell me which ministry or which group is your best option if you want to get closer to Jesus? How about this question? Uh, which person is most qualified to get you 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 the listener you my friend to get you? closer to Jesus. Who is who is best qualified to get you closer to Jesus? We're going to continue to talk about what's so great about Jesus. In these first few passages, we're going to be looking at how Jesus is superior and what this pastor uh, of, the, of the letter of Hebrews is, is telling us, the sermon of Hebrews is telling us about why Jesus is superior. You know, it also talks about, with, within this letter here, it also talks about other spiritual options that the pastor's congregation was pursuing in addition or instead of Jesus. And just as an example, part of the church was probably considering going back to Judaism because of the rise of persecution. It was one of the options that the church was considering instead of Jesus. Just a heads up about today's text as we go through um, the uh, the sermon of Hebrews here. There's going to be a lot of Old Testament quotes. We're going to see some today. Old Testament quotation. Here, here's here's a reason for that. Just remember that the Old Testament was the original believers, that, that first generation of believers, that was their Bible. They didn't have a New Testament because it was in the process of being written. So just because we see some Old Testament quotations doesn't mean that the church had to be only Jewish people. It's just that that was their Bible. Now, it was probably mostly Jewish, but still probably not all Jewish. And because of the Old Testament quotes, because the Old Testament was the only Bible, really, that the original church had, this makes this one of the hardest New Testament books to engage with. Because as the pastor is trying to reveal how much more superior it is, uh, Jesus is, he continually refers back to the Old Testament and draws references from the Old Testament to show us how much greater Jesus is. And so that makes this book one of the hardest books, just to leave Revelation alone all by itself. So that makes Hebrews one of the hardest um, letters in the New Testament to engage with. Let's talk about angels, because we're going to be looking at angels in this passage. What's the big deal with angels? Like today, I would be reading this devotionally, looking at these angels like, well, who cares about angels? What's the big deal? In days past, angels were viewed as those who were in closest proximity with God. I touched on this briefly last week. They were, they were basically, they shared God's throne room. They're sharing the same astral plane, if we could use that expression. They're in the realm of where God is. And so to to the readers of the day, and, and long before that, angels were seen as just these wonderful things. And if you were to get a message from an angel, then that would be practically just like getting a message from God himself. To receive a message from an angel, even spoken from another person, so then we're talking about hearsay, that it was next to canonical. That's the big deal about angels. So let's also remember about this apathy and superiority thing. The problem was apathy. They want many other things above 
Jesus, particularly as persecution is on the rise, uh, they're looking for other options to turn to that would still please God um, and yet also take the persecution uh, off of them, away from them, so they wouldn't have to endure it. They prioritize other content ahead of Jesus' words. And if, uh, for, to the original readers, if there was any content claiming to be from angels, then this would be one of those things that would take their eyes off of Jesus. And the solution is Jesus' superior. So the author attempts to redirect his congregation's attention onto Jesus. Why don't you go ahead and read the text, click the link in the in the show notes there, Hebrews chapter one, verses five to fourteen. Go ahead and read that as we as we look at angels and, and as you look as you're reading it at, at angels, look at what the author has to say about how much more superior Jesus is when compared with angels. Here's the point of this particular episode today. Why following Jesus is your best option. Why following Jesus is your best option. And and I, I would like to talk about options because there are many options these days, and, and not just world religions, not just those blatant options that are that are obvious. I could go to this church or that church, or I could go to mosque, or I could go to temple, or, or whatever. There's so many options when it when it comes to spiritual ideas floating in mainstream media on TV and magazines, just from friends in the neighborhood. We have a ton of options, and also some of the options that we have that take the place of God and Jesus in our life are not spiritual. They're, they distract us from, from ever drawing closer to God. We are surrounded by a ton of options. And so, so really, we need to be thinking about why following Jesus is, is our best option. To understand this, to understand why Jesus is the best option in terms of what I'm going to follow, what I'm going to pursue uh, to, to grow spiritually, to grow at all, I want to look at four boring attribute, attributes that are true of Jesus. I said boring. These are five boring attributes that are true of Jesus. Now, in my mind, they're actually not boring at all. However, this pastor writing the Sermon of Hebrews, he doesn't set these these attributes up as though he's talking about Jesus' greatest and best qualities. The, the author is just talking about the boring basics of who Jesus is. And with these boring basics, you know, I suppose the cool stuff about Jesus is just way too crazy cool, and that would just blow my mind up. So here is the boring basics, which which are way over the top. Let me give you an idea of what we're going to be looking at. Five attributes of Jesus. Family, God, permanent, creator, and effective. Family, he is family with the Father, part of the Trinity. He is God. Uh, he's permanent. His throne will endure forever. He is the creator and the Redeemer, like we talked about in the last episode, and his work is effective. Family, God, permanent, creator, and effective. Let's jump into the content of this episode. Here's the first attribute of Jesus that I want us to take a look at. It's, it's found in verse 5, I want to, and, I, and I'm just summarizing this attribute with the word family. Chapter 1, verse 5 says, For to which of the angels did God ever say, You're my son, today I've become your father? Or again, I will be his father and he will be my son. On our way to youth group this past uh, this past Tuesday night, I got a call from a mom saying that she was tied up at work and she couldn't drive her son in. So she asked if if I would drive him in, and, and that was fine. He's a good kid, and so he came over and he sat in. Uh, he got into my van, and as he was getting in the van, my son Luke, he says, "No, no, no, you sit in the front seat." And I'm just I'm already in the driver's seat, and I'm just listening to this going on. He says, "No, you sit in the front seat." And jo- and and his name is Jonathan. Jonathan says, "Oh, no, 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 you go ahead and sit in the front seat." And Luke's like, no, 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 you sit in the front seat. I think he was trying to show him some respect or honor or something. I'm not really sure what he was trying to do. But anyways, the door is closed and we start backing up. And, and as I'm looking behind me, as I'm backing up, looking out the back window, I, I catch Luke's gaze. And I said to my son, son, why did you do that? Why did you let Jonathan sit in the front seat instead of you sitting in the front seat? He said, well, I, I don't know. I just, I don't know. And that was, that was his answer. So I looked at him and said, son, you're my son. No matter who it is that we're driving, if it's kids that we're driving and your friends, you always sit in the front seat. 
that's an illustration that I'm going to use to help you and I together understand this text a little more. Now, here's the one reason why following one of the reasons why following Jesus is our best option. And in my mind, this is just a logical choice here. Jesus isn't a messenger. He is God's son. Okay, we're talking about family here. If we have to follow someone, and we do, we do follow somebody, we do follow things, then let's follow the one with the closest ties to God, and that is Jesus. Jesus has a unique relationship with God, with the Father. The text says, you are my son. Now, just just honestly, talking about the Trinity makes my head spin just a little. Uh, we, we have never seen anything like it, so we have trouble understanding the Trinity. You know, just like um, you or any, anybody would not be able to explain to me what smelling was like. When I was a kid, I damaged my olfactory, and so I've, I have no memory of ever being able to taste or smell. And so you would never be able to tell me what taste is like or what smell is like in any way that I would understand it because I've never had the experience. Well, that's the same as a trinity. We, have never, we don't have any experience with the trinity except for the observations made by Jesus and that's contained in the Bible. This is something that's been revealed with words but never with sight, except on a few occasions. So in Matthew chapter 3, verses 16 to 17, this is one of those occasions where our sight was engaged here. Matthew 3, 16 to 17, as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and uh, alighting on him. And uh, a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased." That's a passage where we see all three members of the Trinity present together. But honestly, that passage brings brings to mind as many questions as answers. Here, here's my point, though. Here's my point. Maybe I went off on a little bit of a tangent there. Here's my point. Within the Godhead, there are three equal and eternal persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They're all equally God, and they're all equal. God has a relationship within himself that we don't fully understand. Jesus is God and also a person within the Godhead. That makes Jesus the ideal choice for a leader who can connect us with God. Jesus is the best option because Jesus, being God, he's got the closest connection with God. And being the Son, he has the closest connection with the Father and, of course, also with the Spirit. No other claim on God comes above family. The text uses the word angels, and the pastor asks a rhetorical question. Which of the angels did God ever say, you're my son? Of course, God's never called an angel son. And we can extend that beyond angels too. God has called no one his son other than Jesus. Now, of course, if you're a believer, you've placed your faith in Jesus, and you and I are children of God, sons and daughters of God. But outside of that faith component there, God really hasn't done, he hasn't done this with anybody but Jesus. So the question really, in my mind to you, is what is your angel? And I know this is a funny question, but here's where I'm going with this. Remember, angels are significant in this sermon because the readers felt that they were in a position to know God best. They shared the same spiritual plane. Now, there are people today who claim to know something about something, about spiritual planes, speaking to spirits, using quantum physics to explain spirituality, having strange experiences, having, having encounters even with aliens. I don't know why that's helpful. I don't want to single any leader out, but I want you to ask yourself, why is that person more qualified than me to talk about God. The reality is that no one has been called the Son of God other than Jesus. Only Jesus is qualified to talk about God and lead us to Him, because only Jesus has been given that role. Jesus is family, and no one else is, except by faith in Him. And that's, of course, why I began my message with asking the question, which of those small groups or which of the small group leaders or which person in your life is best qualified to lead you closer to Jesus? We're we're talking about uh, equality here. Every single person is equal. 
none of us have a better claim on God. Jesus has the best claim on the Father because they're family, and Jesus is God. Jesus is the best option because you and I are equals. We are unequally qualified to talk on God's behalf. Jesus is the only one who's qualified to talk on God's behalf. If we're looking for some kind of spiritual direction, Jesus in the Bible is the best option to choose. Now, that being said, I wasn't looking down on any of our our group leaders or ministry leaders. They do an absolutely fine job. But the reason why they're trustworthy and the reason why, why we follow leaders like that is because their source is the Bible. Their source is Jesus. Nobody is trying to talk on behalf of God. We go to the book where God has spoken to uh, him, uh, where God has spoken himself. So what's so great about Jesus? Following Jesus is following the one best qualified to speak about spiritual things. Let's talk about another attribute of Jesus. He is God. In chapter 1, verse 6, it says, And again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, Let all God's angels worship him. Jesus is God. Let me give you a little illustration here, because it's hard to see in this text. I'm going to pull it out for a second. Um, sometimes, and it happens more than once, I, I have to confess it happens more than once, sometimes I will I will call the kids to the dinner table, I will serve dinner to the kids, and uh, they'll say, did you make this, Daddy? And I'll say, yes. And they'll say, mmm, this is really good, I love your cooking, and I'll say, thank you. But when in reality, it was actually my wife who made it. And of course, she'll she'll put me in my place Almost right away, she'll let me. She'll let my my folly kind of uh, extend, and then and then she'll set me up for a big failure, and everybody will laugh at me because because in my house people generally know that if it's not waffles or hamburgers, then Daddy didn't cook it. Because well, come on, I can't I can't smell, I can't taste. I'm not a good cook. So here here's here's the thing: when I when I give the kids food that mommy made and say that I made it, and they say, "Ooh, daddy, you're so great, you're so great," I'm receiving worship, the worship due the creator of the food, and that's and that's Michelle. I want you to look at the word worship in in the text there. I don't deserve to be worship. Neither do angels. No one does. My wife comes close, but still, no. Only God deserves to be worshipped. So so this verse is showing us two things about Jesus. Jesus is superior to angels because they worship him. That's the first thing it's showing us. And second of all, Jesus is God because only God is worshipped. I mean, let's put two and two together here. The only one worthy of worship is God. In my mind, this is the reason why following Jesus is our greatest option. But the author expands it. Everything else is called to worship him. The text says, let all angels worship him. You know that phrase, let all, just those little two words. That's a really, that's a really big deal. It's really telling. Whatever other option exists to be followed, that option will one day be forced to acknowledge Jesus as God. So what's so great about Jesus? Following Jesus is following the one that everything and everyone else will one day be commanded to bow down to. Let's talk about the third attribute of Jesus. Jesus is permanent. Chapter 1, verse 8 says, But about the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. I recently had a Jehovah's Witness come to my door, and I don't spend a ton of time talking to them, but I do talk to them just a little bit. And in this last this last time I was talking to this person, I I got confused, but not not because of the Bible. I got confused because they changed what they believe. I had, you know, I I used to be ready to talk to Jehovah's Witnesses when they came to my door because I knew that I knew their content. I knew what it is that they were going to be telling me. And then I was able to to um, talk to them and sort of uh, say, help them to see the Bible and give them a different perspective here. This time I was I was a little confused because what they were telling me is not 
what I'm used to Jehovah's Witnesses telling me. And uh, so I did a little research, and, and they've changed their beliefs again. Jehovah's Witnesses actually changed their beliefs uh, many times. And it's not just JWs. Uh, there are other people. Mormons have changed their beliefs many times. What Jesus has done will never be undone. When we're looking at things that Jesus does, his work, his words are the only thing that will never be changed. They're constant forever. The text says last forever. When speaking about authority, the conclusion is that Jesus' authority will never end. Whatever Jesus has set up will be continued forever because his authority to set things up will never be challenged and will never be lost. So when compared with angels... Even angels, spiritual and seemingly eternal beings, they change roles and they are inconsistent. Even angels are inconsistent. And some of you might say, no, they're not. They stay the same all the time. Look at Gabriel. All through. Okay, well, what about Lucifer? He changed roles. Even angels are inconsistent. What does the picture of your future look like? Does it involve Money, eternity, respect, fame, nirvana, enlightenment. What is your future in your mind? What does it look like? Every world religion or philosophical idea and even scientific facts have been cha- have been challenged and changed. There is no constant in the universe apart from God. Everything changes. Even what we know about science, everything changes, including every spiritual option that people have ever chosen to follow. Jesus is the best option because he's the only constant in the universe and the only constant in eternity. So what's so great about Jesus? Following Jesus comes with an eternal guarantee that no other option can give. Here's the fourth attribute of Jesus. He's the creator. Creator. Verse 10 says, He also says, In the beginning, Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will wear out like a garment. You'll roll them up like a robe. Like a garment, they will be changed, but you remain the same, and your years will never end. Okay, very briefly, because we touched on this one last week, Jesus is the source of everything. The text says, you laid the foundations of the earth. And that, that word foundations, when we look at that, we remember that Jesus is the person within the Trinity who did all the creating. And not independently of the Father, of course, but Jesus is that person in the Trinity that said, let there be light. He's the creator. So doesn't that mean, since Jesus is the creator, since Jesus created everything, doesn't that mean that all of the other options available are, say, aberrations or deviations from Jesus' original design? Like, we're taking what's been created, and we're looking to the created as though it was the creator and eternal. Jesus is the best option because he wasn't created as an option. He is the objective truth and the beginning of everything. Nothing is sustainable independent of Jesus. The text says, you will roll them up like a robe. Now, here's what that means in my mind. It means that no other option is sustainable. Every other option is headed toward its final resting place, except for the option to follow Jesus. So what's so great about Jesus? Following Jesus is eternally sustainable. Here's a fifth characteristic of Jesus effective. Verse 13 says, to which the angels did God ever say, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. You know, I've had a lot of questions through the years. I've had some doubts, but I have never questioned or doubted that choice that I made to uh, to place my faith in Jesus and, and to follow him. I've never regretted it. I've never looked back and said, I wonder if that was a good idea. I've never said, I wonder if there's, if there's a better idea. Now, I have gotten complacent. I have. I've gotten a little plastic at times. But I've never gone back on that original choice and said, you know, that was a stupid idea. Maybe there's something better. Never. If you will choose him, you will find that he is the option that you are looking for. And if you will truly, with all your heart, place your faith in him and start following him, you won't look back and say, oh man, I can't believe I made that choice. I need to find a better choice. That's not who Jesus is. Jesus' path is recognized by God the Father as completed and effective. 
and, and you'll recognize that as well. Now, the text says, sit at my right hand. I want to talk about right hand. Last week, we talked about what the seated position means. It means his work is completed. This time, I want to look at, at the right hand. The right hand for the original congregation, it meant the strong hand, the hand of authority. So the phrase then means that Jesus acts with full authority of the complete Godhead. It's a phrase that confirms Jesus' actions are legitimate and Jesus' actions are accepted. Your faith in Jesus has made you completely acceptable to God because God has made Jesus' way completely effective. God has made no other way completely effective because only Jesus sits at the right hand of God. So what's so great about Jesus? Following Jesus is effective. Here's, here's why following Jesus is your best option. Okay, we went through five attributes of who Jesus is. Five attributes that Jesus has. Here's why following Jesus is your best option. It's in alignment with God. It's guaranteed by God. It's eternally sustainable. And it's exclusively recognized by God as effective. So let me just leave you with one phrase. Okay, I had a lot of words here. The, the podcast went on and on, didn't actually. It was shorter than last week's, I think. So here, here's one phrase that I want to leave with you to, to, take, to take away with you. And here it is. Choose to follow Jesus. If you have not yet chosen to place your faith in Jesus, I I can say from personal experience that uh, I have found no better option. And since I've placed my faith in Jesus, I have not wanted to look around for a better option. I'm fully convinced, and I have never doubted, and I've never said, oh man, I wish I didn't do that. I've always been confident since I've placed my faith in Jesus, and I'm going to ask you, just just try him out. He's not going to let you down. Uh, You're not going to be kicking yourself in the butt later on saying, man, I can't believe I did that foolish thing I was suckered in. That's not it at all. We're talking about a real person. We're talking about the person of Jesus who is also God, we're talking about God, who's very personal and wants to connect with you as a friend. You can keep your religion to yourself. He doesn't want your religion. He wants your friendship. He's not going to be asking you to jump through hoops because this is based on performance. It's based on friendship. He wants your faith and faithfulness, which in another word for that is friendship. So so the, the phrase just for you to take with you, would you please do this? Choose to follow Jesus. That's it for this episode. God bless you. See you again next week.